We have Dr. Robert Retwood um, presenting today. I think a few of you might have met him during lunch. He was generous enough with his time to come join us. And he is currently the chief resident at the UW Preventive Medicine Residency's health system track and also works clinically as an emergency physician in Portage, Wisconsin. And he, uh, he has done emergency medicine QI work in Ethiopia and Ghana and has interest in emergency medicine administration, patient safety, and process improvement. Let me know if that's incorrect. That's absolutely uh, correct. Okay, great. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Redwood. Thank you. So thank you, Sweta, for the generous introduction, and thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, so yeah, I had a chance to sit with the Tibetans at lunch, and so very interesting to hear about your hospital. They have more tuberculosis in a day than I probably see, have seen ever, um, and their emergency department is staffed by all the doctors in the hospital, so everybody's coming down and doing their share. Very different from the emergency departments I'm used to, where we have emergency medicine specialists who just, I, I stay in the emergency department the whole day, I don't know what goes on in the rest of my hospital yet. So. Um, and uh, like Sueta said, I actually am doing two specialties, so um, I, have, I kind of have two lives. I work in an emergency department full time, and I work a lot of nights and weekends, and during the week, I'm working in preventive medicine. So I'm looking at upstream determinants of health, what gets people into the hospital in the first place, and then also health systems. So how can we build smarter health systems, and how can we eliminate waste, eliminate variation, build safer systems? So that's a lot of what I'll be talking about today. So um, objectives for today, we're going to briefly review qu the quality movement in medicine in general. I think you've probably talked about this, but I think the U.S. quality experience is relevant and um, kind of sets the stage for how we're thinking today. And then we'll talk about the emergency department and how this clinical environment is unique in terms of quality and um, in terms of medical error. So me you know, when we talk about quality, a lot of it is lack of error. Um, we'll talk about a systems-based approach to quality improvement. And, um, and then finally, we'll talk about uh, an actual case, so a mock quality case where we're going to divide up into three groups and solve a problem together. And I'm really excited to hear about everyone's different perspective, because any problem, you can attack it from various angles. And the emergency department is such a, a complex place that hopefully we've given you a general problem and you'll be, people will attack it from different angles and come up with different solutions. Originally, I had this talk kind of uh, front-loaded with more talking and then the project at the end. I think it's right after lunch and maybe our bellies are a little bit full and maybe it would be better to do a little bit of talking at the front, a lot of group work in the middle and a little bit of talking at the end. So um, I appreciate your patience. We'll kind of get halfway through, skip to the end and then come back. So, um, And if you see, do we have anyone from Addis in the crowd? Any Ethiopians? Okay, excellent. Um, and I want to also introduce my, my co-presenters here, Dan Perhanu and Michelle Loom Vigor. They're both emergency medicine residents. They're both interested in global health. So Dan is actually first generation Ethiopian. So his parents are both Ethiopian. He's a doctor here in the US. And they're both going to South Africa later this year to work in an emergency department. Um, and they've, they've got a strong interest in process improvement and they've been generous enough to offer their time. So you'll, they'll be small group facilitators with us and I thank them for uh, joining us today. So for those of you from Addis, you're going to notice some familiar sites here. Every time you see a slide in red, I'm actually going to show you some images from the emergency department in Black Lion Hospital. And um, I, I love the emergency department there. I've worked with the Klilu. He's done amazing things, and the residents as well, bringing up the program. And uh, I just had so much to learn there. So I want to, in terms of process improvement, I want to kind of show you some low resource settings. Um, and say, you know, what's been done in this setting, what could be done elsewhere, because anywhere you go, it's going to be different. And my headaches in my emergency department are different than the headaches they're having in Addis, different than the headaches you're having in Tibet, and I think there's so much group wisdom here that we can all learn from. So, uh, I'll start you off with a quote. The burden of harm conveyed by the collective impact of all our healthcare problems is staggering. So this is where we're at in the 1990s. Um, we're just starting to realize how much error is actually going on in healthcare. And I don't think, you know, I, I wasn't practicing during that time, but the general impression I get is there weren't as many metrics in healthcare as there are nowadays. Surgeons were tracking surgical site infections, readmissions were being counted. 
But now you see, you know, a hospital administrator comes in in the U.S. and they have a dashboard on their computer that says, you know, how many central line infections did we have? How many catheters were placed incorrectly? We're using data to make healthcare better, a lot like they're doing in manufacturing communities. And so you're seeing this um, wisdom that came out of industries like the airline industry or the nuclear industry incorporated into the healthcare industry. Um, and what we see now and what we talk about now is this triple aim. So before, we were just talking about the problem. What are the, why are these medical errors occurring? Now we're talking about solutions. Yes, we want to improve clinical care, but there's a lot more to it than clinical care. We want to improve the health of our populations as well. You know, if, you've, if you're, this is your first time of, in, uh, in America, you're probably noticing a lot of obesity. Um, you're probably noticing safer streets and safer built environment. I'm not sure if our smoking rates are the same as your country. So there's a lot of things that land you, that you can change before people get to the hospital. Um, in, t in the lens of emergency medicine, this population health might be things like injury prevention. Are our streets well lit? Um, it might mean an EMS service. Do we have a hospital to bring our traumas to the emergency department so we can do things in a timely manner? Um, it might be things like disaster preparedness. What if a tsunami hits? What if there's an infectious disease outbreak? How is our emergency department going to play a role in helping our community? Uh, and then the other part of the triple aim is reducing cost. And so that's, you know, I was, uh, again, when we were talking about healthcare in Tibet, their patients eat for a dollar a day, all three meals. Um, the, the budgets that we're talking about are vastly different here. And one of our big problems in the U.S. is we have a lot of money and we don't spend it wisely. In fact, we spend it very poorly. In fact, sometimes we spend money to make people worse. Um, and we're trying to learn how to streamline our processes, spend smarter, um, so we can deliver the best care for populations. Now, every day in the ED, you know, in my research life, I'm thinking about populations. In, Every day in the ED, I'm thinking a lot about my system. What is my emergency department doing? And this is, uh, this is a diagram that um, I've adapted from another person's work um, of how, what the ED looks like. And I like to think of it as kind of a living, breathing organism. So in the middle, you have the people. It starts with the patient, of course, the providers, the doctors, the nurses, also the radiology techs, the lab techs, the unit clerks, the custodians. You go into, into an ED and it looks like a beehive, all these people moving around, doing these activities. Well, are they, are they working together? Is it a collaborative effort? Are any people butting heads and actually slowing down patient care or introducing error? And then if you look at the green circle in the bottom right, we're talking about technology. Do you have an electronic health record? What kind of radiology systems are you using? What kind of devices are you doing to, um, to use your procedures? Do you have an ultrasound machine? Are you able to cardiovert people? And so there's all these tools that we use, and we have to make sure these tools are working in sync and that we're using them smartly. Um, and sometimes a tool can do the wrong thing. You know, you see something on your radiology study that's not actually an emergency, uh, and you act on it and create kind of a cascade of events that causes harm rather than help. I talk about the ED environment. So is your ED noisy? Is there a line outside the door? Is the physician or the nurse getting interrupted every five seconds? I can tell you all of these things are yes, yes, yes. And so how does that affect your decision-making process? How does that affect patient care? Um, in, the, in the first emergency department I worked in, there were, uh, there were no curtains or anything. Everyone was in bi one big room, so there was no patient privacy. Um, there wasn't very good infection control. What does that mean for the patient experience versus all the patients in quiet, closed rooms? Do the nurses know what's happening to their patients? These are all parts of the ED system. Um, when I talk about ED organization, the red circle, that's about the flow of the ED. How is your emergency department built? When a patient comes to the door to triage, what happens next? Are they waiting? Do they see a nurse immediately? Do they see a doctor immediately? Is someone keeping records? And so anytime we are trying to improve the emergency department, we're thinking about this whole system and how things interact. If you do a QI project just with personnel, I'm going to teach the doctors to do things better. How effective will that be? You might teach some doctors to do things better, but what if you said, I'm going to teach the doctors to do things better, and I'm going to build a protocol where the nurses remind the doctors to do things better? Would that work even better? What if you built it into your health record? What if you had a box they had to check to say, yes, I have confirmed that I've done this better? What if you have an administrator who goes on once a month and actually checks and makes sure that your numbers are high and that that process is happening? So anytime you try to improve your emergency department, you want to do it in such a way that it's sustainable and that the progress that you make isn't lost when you leave or when something changes or when a new personnel comes in. 
So you want to think about the whole system. Does that make sense? All right. And this is open question. So anytime you have any question, please just raise your hand, and uh, I encourage you to join in. So th we're taking a systems break here. Okay, this may look familiar for you in Addis. We're talking about tools and technology. So um, in in, a, in some parts of Africa, Addis would actually be a very high resource setting. You know, we're we're dealing with some people who are in rural clinics, so it's just an open room. Addis has CT scanners. They have general surgery. Um, they have a medical education program. So it's it is literally the education hub of Ethiopia. Um, on the other hand, if you compare it to a U.S. hospital. You know, we see somebody manually bagging a patient. You know, there's, there aren't enough ventilators to staff the ED. So there's a whole spectrum of what kind of resources you're dealing with, and you're going to have to be creative on how you use these resources. So just the way I like to look at these pictures is what's present, what's, um, what's absent, what's done right, what could be do done better. So does anything stick out to you looking at these two pictures in terms of the tools or technology? Any brave souls out there? So how about the patient on the left? Um, this is a patient who had a pneumothorax, traumatic pneumothorax, and they have a chest tube draining it out. This is a great tool they're using. All you're trying to do is get the fluid out, the blood out, the pus out. Okay? Could it be better? It could probably be better. We have a device called a Pluravac where you can measure more specifically how much you're getting out, where you can test for an air leak. But at the end of the day, you just need a simple tube to get that out. And it's done under, you know, it's, uh, it's cleanly dressed, it's draining well. So that's a very useful tool to have in a low resource setting. You know, you see some pictures and this is done with Coca-Cola bottles. So this is a very low tech thing. As an emergency physician, I, I look at that patient though and I think, wow, that bed's pretty high. That's a critical patient. What if I had to do CPR? Am I gonna climb up on the bed? Am I gonna move them down to the floor? You know, that's part of the way we think is, well, what's the next step if things don't go how we're, we're planning it? In the picture on the right, um, obviously we have, we have a, a patient family member who's ventilating the patient with a bag valve mask. Is that ideal? No, not ideal. Ideally, you'd probably have a, a ventilator and a respiratory therapist there. It's not going to happen yet. They don't have the resources yet for those equipments, but how could this be better? Has that person been taught how to bag properly? Do they know if they're bagging correctly? What indications are they looking for? And so that's an area where you can improve quality, or maybe it's already uh, optimized. The, the thing I like about this picture, I actually intubated this patient. If you look behind the woman in the orange hat, there's a single outlet there. So during my, during my intubation, I had to choose between having a pulse oximeter to measure their oxygen and have suction for the procedure. Um, and so that, you know, the, I actually did a mini QI project that day, and we went out and got an adapter splitter. So there's two outlets there now, so you can have both at the same time. And that's part of, I mean, that's just the hand you're dealt. If your emergency department only has one outlet in one place, how are you going to tweak that? What tools are going to be available to you? So even if you had a ventilator, even if you had suction, even if you had a pulse oximeter, if you only have one outlet, you're not going to be able to deliver the type of care you need. And this is every day. This happens in my own ER too. Every single day, you're running into headaches, things that need to be fixed, things that you address as a group and as a system to try to improve. So let's jump back to the big picture. Um, Healthcare quality in the, in the US and the patient safety movement started with the Healthcare Quality Initiative. So the first report to Errors Human came out in 1999, and the number of errors or the number of deaths attributed to medical error in the US was cited as 98,000. And the analogy you're going to hear over and over again is two, it's the equivalent of two jumbo jets crashing in our nation every day. Now, people have disputed the numbers and, and talked about those figures, but at the end of the day, it really brought to light in the U.S. healthcare community that we are harming people by, um, by having unsafe systems. And the second part of the report said, well, now that we've identified the harm, what are we going to do next? How are we going to make it better? And there was another big report by the Institute of Medicine called Crossing the Quality Chasm, and it said, this is the next step. So we want to build safe systems. We want to have effective care, patient-centered care, timely care, efficient care, and equitable care. Um, so those were the goals. And that, I think a lot of those actually merged into the triple aim that we talk about now. Um, and those are worldwide goals. I think, all, I think any of us can agree that those are the kind of care that you want to deliver for your patients. Um, and then the final step of the, of the Healthcare Quality Initiative came out in multiple reports. It said, well, how are we going to get there? We know the problem. We know there's a lot of medical error going on. We know where we want to be. We want to have the triple aim achieved. And they're going to get there on the environmental level, 
at the healthcare organization level and at the individual patient doctor level. From an emergency medicine standpoint, I love this, okay? Environmental level, let's keep people out of the emergency department. You know, you may, be a li you may live in a country where people cook on the floor and little kids can run around to boiling pots of water. You may live in a country where there are exposed wires, okay, and people can get shocks. You may live in a country where there aren't light, there's not lighting on the street and people fall into, you know, fall off the sidewalk or get hit by cars. We live in a country where people are allowed to ride around on motorcycles without helmets. We live in a country where, or a state where six-year-olds can ride four-wheel uh, vehicles, these ATVs, and we see six-year-olds who, you know, don't even, <laughs> you know, don't know how to read, don't know how to um, clean up after themselves, who are riding you know, powerful vehicles. We live in a country uh, where you can walk into public buildings like courthouses and hospitals with guns attached. So. Um, just, because, just because the U.S. is a high-resource environment doesn't mean we don't have problems in the environment around the emergency department. Now, my, the scope of my work is really at the level of the healthcare organization and the patient-physician interaction. How can we make that better? That's what we're talking about once a patient comes into the emergency department. How can we make our system serve the patient, and how can we make that interaction between the physician and the patient a high-yield interaction? So we'll take another break, a little systems break here. This is, now I'm talking about organization. So this means ED flow and how things work. Um, on the left, you have a picture of uh, men delivering two tanks of oxygen to the ED. So that's very interesting. I've never actually seen how oxygen gets delivered to my healthcare environment. There's a little crank on the wall, and I turn it to the left, and oxygen comes out. I've never run out of oxygen. It's something that I don't even think about. It doesn't even enter the equation. Um, Here's what I ask is, how often does that truck come? What if it gets a flat tire? Is there enough oxygen to last if, um, if we have a lot of needs that week? Is there a backup system in place? Can we borrow oxygen from surgery? These are the kind of the things that were going through my head as I saw that truck pull up. Um, and if you're running an emergency department in a low resource setting, you've got to think about redundancy. Um, so a lot like, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't build a helicopter anymore with just one engine. What happens when that engine fails? Um, a lot about safety in, in healthcare now is about building in redundancy and having a plan B. Um, another side, on the other side is a diagram. This is a diagram of the, of the Black Lion Emergency Department that I made. How is it laid out? And if uh, you're obviously gonna have space constraints if you're designing an ED, but just walk yourself through. So you're a patient and you walk through the gray area, that gray box there, you're in an outdoor waiting area. You talk to a registration person. You sit in a, in a bed in your triage, usually by a medical student, a surgical or um, medicine medical student, and either your condition is treated there, um, if it can be, if you're able to get a prescription and go home, or you're brought into the emergency department, admitted to the emergency department. There's a nurse's station, there's a resident station. Is that layout, is that layout perfect for your situation, or is it acceptable for your situation? I thought actually it worked really well in Black Line. Um, there's always headaches. The surgical patients are waiting for surgery. That's a bottleneck. and so. Those patients sometimes wait there for days. Are they getting their vital signs checked enough, things like that? In the US, a lot of it has to do with flow. We have long lines outside our EDs. We have long lines in the waiting room. How do you get the fast patients through quickly? Some emergency departments are divided into pods. You'll have a pod for chest pain complaints, a pod for abdominal pain complaints, a pod for trauma, a pod for minor things. Um, I've seen emergency departments that are done like a racetrack where it's a round emergency department, all the providers are in the middle, and then you can keep an eye over all the patients. Um, some emergency departments are designed very badly. They used to be something else, and somebody just said, well, let's make this an emergency department. They didn't think it through very much, and um, you may have an infectious disease patient sitting next to an immunocompromised patient. You may have a patient with a traumatic injury who's in this tiny room where you don't have room to do anything. Um, and so as you think about organization in your system, as you're trying to improve your system, you have to think about how is a patient going to flow through the ED. Any questions? Do you guys recognize the uh, oxygen delivery? Yeah. <laughs> um, so we've talked about quality. We've talked about patient safety. Let's talk about error. And this is what I'm interested in. I have committed lots of errors, lots of errors in my work. And the, my initial, every time I do something wrong, every time I hurt a patient, the first thing I think is, wow, I'm a bad doctor, I'm a bad doctor. And I slap myself on my wrist and I beat myself up. And it's a counterproductive mentality and it's a daily challenge for me to get over that mentality and be like, how can I learn from this? How much of this is me? How much of this is the system? And what am I gonna do differently next time? 
In the old days, we had, a, we had a, a pretty counterproductive system, and some of you may recognize this system. Some of you may practice an environment with this. I, I call it the blame and train system, where you have a e morbidity and mortality conference. The doctor who caused the error stands up in front of everyone, or usually the junior doctor, and tells you what they did wrong, and everyone pounces on them, attacks them. Oh, you could have done this better. You could have done this better. You could have done this better. Uh, it's a good way to learn as an individual, but it doesn't really help the next person as much as it could. You know, what if you sat down as a group with everyone in the emergency department, the nurses, the techs, the, you know, a patient representative, and said, you know, this is what happened. How much of this was the, the doctor's fault, the nurse's fault, but how much of this was the system? Could the system have prevented this? So let's talk about definitions. Medical error is, is a term where you deviate from standard care for whatever reason, and somebody undergoes harm because of it. So that's a very useful definition. Um, an adverse event, or actually that's any deviation in care. An adverse event is where um, you, you deviate from protocol and somebody is actually harmed. And then the last one I like, I'm going to read it outright, is a near miss. This is my favorite of the three. A situation in which an event or omission or sequence of events or omissions arises during clinical care, and, um, but harm fails to develop regardless of whether or not you did something to to interrupt it. So a near miss is this is gold. This is where somebody almost gets hurt, but they aren't hurt. And you can learn from that experience. So this is when you're on your helicopter, this is one engine going out, right? Could have been two, but it was only one. What can we do next time to prevent that engine from going out? Um, and I think uh, in the emergency, or in co the quality improvement movement in emergency medicine, we're really trying to find these near misses and learn from the near misses. So let's all take a look at the picture here. Somebody left his scissors in this patient's chest cavity. It's kind of a problem. Um, keep that picture in mind as I go to the next slide, and we'll talk about uh, what kind of error that is. So in the ED, there's really, we've divided errors into two types. There's practitioner errors and system errors. So practitioner error could be a cognitive error. I don't know what drug to give this pregnant woman with a resistant MRSA infection. I just don't know. It could be a missed radiologic finding. Something subtle, and this actually happens quite a bit, where you miss something on an x-ray or a CT that actually is critical and needs to be acted on. Um, it could be a policy deviation. The policy's in place. You're supposed to wash your hands. There's hand gel there, but it's 20 feet from the patient room. So somebody decides to skip it because it's kind of annoying to walk all the way over to get the hand gel. Um, or it could be a procedure error. Any time we're doing something in medicine, um, it's a skill. It's a learned skill, and you're going to perform differently if you've only done one or if you've done 100 of these procedures as opposed to systems errors. So is someone triaged correctly? Did we recognize that how sick they were? Did we act on that fast enough? Um, did our teamwork fall apart somewhere? Is the staff angry at each other? Is there too little staff? Um, are they just not working well together for whatever reason today? Uh, or is it the environment itself? Are there too many distractions? Is the ED crowded? I mean, when you have a crowded emergency department, things fall apart. And I, I sympathize for you guys working in, at Blackline. You're always crowded. Am I wrong? I mean, imagine working in Black Island Emergency Department and you had five patients. Do you think they would get different care? When you have that time to dedicate, and, you know, and, and I, I'm lucky now, I actually work in an emergency department where sometimes we clear out the waiting room. Um, it's not the case at UW. I think UW is probably closer to Addis where it's busy all the time. So let's go back to the scissors. How many think this is a practitioner error? And then how many think it's a systems error? So show of hands for practitioner-based error. Yeah, sure, you left the scissors inside. How many for uh, systems error? And this is a feel-good question. You're, you're both right. So um, somebody had to leave the scissors inside. But if you had the best surgeon in the world and they were getting interrupted 100 times a minute and they had four more patients to see, it was a disaster scenario, the bus just rolled over, whatever, it's very likely that the best surgeon in the world could make a mistake like this. So that makes you, that begs the question, well, how could the system be better? Um, do you do an instrument count before and after the procedure? Do you do a chest x-ray before and after the procedure to make sure that uh, things were done correctly? Um, do you try to minimize distractions and create an OR environment so you actually have a quiet place to work? So there's obviously two sides to every coin, and uh, I think that's the nature of error, is there's practitioner elements and systems elements. So when you do your QI projects, whether you're an administrator, a nurse supervisor, a physician, you've got to think about the individual but also the system. And I think, you, I think we all know that, right? It's about bringing it back to your institution and making sure that um, 
that our colleagues know that and, uh, and that we get everyone on the same page. So, I like this diagram to the left. Have you guys seen the Swiss cheese diagram? Is that well known? Yeah, okay. This is the reasons model of error. So uh, we are each one piece of cheese, right? <laughs> and humans will make errors. No one is perfect. I think we can all agree on that. We all have our holes in different places. So the idea is to try to create systems um, where the holes don't line up. And that, that analogy makes sense to everyone? Yeah, okay. Um, so this is a study on ED error that just gives us kind of an idea of how big a problem error is in the ED. I write that we know of at the top because one of the problems with emergency medicine, one of the challenges is I don't know what happens to my patients after they leave. If you come into my ED, I meet you for two or three hours, I either send you home, I send you into the hospital, I send you into the ICU, or I transfer you to another hospital. I think I'm probably very thorough with patient follow-ups. I, I think I follow up one in 10 patients. So probably one in 10, I know what happens to them. Um, and so I'll make a note as I work, I'll say call this person, call this doctor who I transferred to, find out what happened three days from now. Um, and a lot, of the, a lot of the education that's going on in emergency medicine is about trying to build a system where we can learn what happened to our patients. Because I really won't know if an error happened. If I prescribe the wrong antibiotic and my patient's kidney fails, is someone going to call me and tell me that? Probably not, you know. Um, and so you can build in systems uh, that actually let people find out what their error is. So in the ED, we have an inherent challenge of not even knowing what we did wrong. That's really difficult. You know, we go home every night and pat ourselves on the back. I made no errors today. <laughs> Meanwhile, somebody upstairs is complaining about me. Oh, Dr. Redwood forgot to check a creatinine. Dr. Redwood didn't draw blood cultures. You know, and so um, that's a big part of the thing is actually doing patient follow-up. The University of uh, UW here, every patient that they discharge, a nurse calls them within 24 hours and asks how they're doing. Every single patient is phenomenal. Um, that is not the standard of care. Maybe someday it will be, uh, but it takes resources to catch errors like this. So in a low resource environment, how are you even gonna know what your errors are? It's a challenge. 3% in the US, 3% of all errors take place in the ED. I actually think this is a high number. I first looked at it, I thought, ooh, that's nice. Three is low. But if you think a patient who's admitted to the hospital might be there for five days, in my ED, they're only there for five hours. So if I commit an, an error in that small of a space, that's actually a pretty high percentage of total errors. And of the errors that are reported, about two-thirds are reported by doctors or nurses. That number also disturbs me because two-thirds of the people in the ED aren't doctors or nurses. There's a lot of patients in the ED. There's a lot of techs. There's a lot of assistants. Um, there's a lot of radiologists and consultants coming through. Why is it that only the the physicians and nurses are reporting errors. Are other people scared to report errors? Do they have a way that they can report errors in the first place? And so that's another thing you can do is kind of keep your ED open for error reporting so everyone feels comfortable. Um, it makes a lot of sense that the elderly and medical complex, medically complex, um, that errors occur in them disproportionately. Uh, if you never entered a hospital, you would never have a healthcare related error occur. It's only as you consume these healthcare services that we introduce our chance for error. So if you have one organ system that's, that's failing, if you have a broken bone, you know, that's so much percent chance for error. If you have two organ systems, if it's your heart and your lungs, more chance for error. So the sicker you are, the older you are, the more chances you have that an error is gonna occur at some point in your stay. Um, and then the errors that we deal with are errors in diagnostic studies, errors in procedures or ED flow, and then errors with high-risk drugs. Those are a big amount of our errors. So what, what kind of errors do you guys think you see in your emergency departments? Or let me ask this, who works in an emergency department ever? Sometimes, okay. Who is an administrator who thinks about the emergency department in your work? A few, okay, okay. What kind of clinical environment, so um, let's, let's see. So what, for the rest of the group, what, what would you say your interaction with the emergency department is? Do we have uh, doctors who sometimes come down to the emergency department here? Or nurses who have worked through this? Yeah? What kind of, I'm going to put you on the spot. I'm sorry. What kind of errors do you think? Do you see medication errors and diagnostic errors, or are you seeing other types of error? Uh, sometimes, uh, mostly, I think uh, technical, like when you do uh, treatment pattern for certain days, we have sometimes really good chance of uh, even interacting with the, with kind of technical errors that we get. Sure, perfect, perfect. So procedural errors. This is a great example of, um, of a type of error that people are trying, that hardworking quality improvement specialists are trying to improve with a system. 
So in surgery, they've developed the checklist. You do a timeout before the procedure. Is everyone here? Is the room quiet? Do we have our supplies? Is this the right patient? Is this the right procedure? Let's go. I don't do that in my emergency department for all procedures. I do it for three of them. And the reason I do it is because my hospital administrator decided these are key procedures. We're going to track that you do this. So they make sure I do it every time. I'm not a bad doctor, I hope. I try to do my best, but I'm busy. I'm running around. And the reason I'm doing this is because somebody put a smart policy in place. And so that's an example of if you're putting in a central line, are you doing it in a clean, sterile way? If you're doing an intubation, I mean, you're taking away somebody's ability to breathe with an intubation. That's a very high-risk procedure. But when I do intubations, the drugs are always pre-weighed out. Um, we check with every patient that they don't have any allergies. It feels much safer to me. I actually like working better under these conditions because the system allows me to feel safe um, and commit less errors. So thank you for sharing, Sundra. Um, other reasons the ED is a high risk environment for error. Um, we do use a lot of dangerous drugs. So sterile injectables, opiates, antiarrhythmics, paralytics. This is just high risk. And it is high acuity care, so we need to have these drugs. This is fundamental to our care process. But when a bad thing happens with one of these drugs, it's serious. Um, we talked about the procedures. We're doing a lot of high risk procedures. Um, and then there's a lot of life and death decisions that are basically being made with incomplete information. When someone comes into ED, we, we don't even know their vital signs when they first walk in. We don't know if their blood pressure is in the tank. We don't know if they're having a stroke. Things sort of unfold as you're working, and you have to be very comfortable with making a decision before you have complete information. And it's a very challenging part of our work and uh, a very ripe area for quality improvement projects because when you're dealing with um, incomplete information, a smarter system can sort of uh, be a safeguard against that, against bad things happening. And then we talked about the lack of follow-up. So uh, here's another break for systems. Remember, we're, we're dealing with these five elements of the ED system. So this is the role of tasks. So on the top left, you see a patient. She was 30 years old. She needed chemotherapy. She came to the ED because someone had injected a chemotherapeutic agent into her artery, and her hand died. She has a necrotic hand now. Um, in the airline industry or the nuclear industry, this would be called a never event. Okay, so this should happen one time and it should never happen again because it's so preventable that we should act on it. And this is not to say this only happens in Ethiopia. I see never events come into my emergency department. So um, the, the point is, if you have a system in place that can adapt to these big problems, if you have a committee that can learn from it, talk about it, and put in something in place to prevent it from happening, um, you can really save a lot of bad outcomes. So it might be as simple as, as labeling the drug you know, it might be as simple as pulling, drawing back to make sure you're in a vein and not an artery when you do the procedure. Maybe the person who did it was inexperienced and there needs to be more oversight or more teamwork until they're allowed to do something on their own. Who knows why this happened, but it happened. And I think we can all agree that as healthcare providers, this is, this is something that we, should, that we should see and it should be a red flag. This is a never event, people. So when you go back to your institutions, think about, think about it. If, if you have a never event happen, you can go home and be frustrated and say, what? An idiot. What, who did that? How could, how could they be so dumb? Or you could go home and be like, how can our system prevent that next time? And we had a uh, St. Mary's Hospital. This is in the newspaper, so I'm not divulging anything. But St. Mary's Hospital across town had a, um, a patient who had an epidural. And they're, um, so they were pregnant, and they had intrathecal injection to, uh, to basically um, alleviate the pain during childbirth. And their, the little attachment where you attach the drugs to their epidural and the drugs to their IV was the same attachment. They looked identical. The two hoses ran together and the nurse chose the wrong hose and she put the medication that was supposed to go into the spinal fluid into the patient's vein and a young pregnant woman died in our hospital here. So I mean this is an equivalent of the chemotherapy going into the artery here and as a result St. Mary's um, they changed the size on the two on the two different tubes. So now if if that same situation occurred and someone tried to do that, they would physically not be able to because the two pieces don't even match up. So, of course, you need resources to do this. Maybe you don't have different size syringes. Maybe that would be too costly. But this is an example of building a smarter system. And it can happen anywhere in the world regardless of your resources. So we're almost to our activity that we're going to be doing together. Um, but I just want to talk a little bit about how we think about error and how we measure error. 
Um, so everybody knows now in, emergency, in the emergency world that we're committing errors. Everyone knows that we need to make ED safer. So how are we going to do it? Um, this researcher, Pham et al., said, well, let's be like the airline industry. Let's be like the nuclear industry. Let's measure how often patients are harmed. Let's measure how often we do things right. Let's measure how well people, or how good people are at improving errors. So um, the administrator under this system would come in, the ED director would come in in the morning and say, no patients were harmed yesterday. That was a good day. Or two patients were harmed. Let's talk about why that happened. Um, they'll say, everyone who was septic got uh, blood cultures drawn. Excellent. Everyone who had a pneumonia had the right antibiotic prescribed. Excellent. Or they'd say, well, look, these two people had resistant pneumonias. The wrong antibiotic was given. What did we do wrong? So that's one way of looking at error. Um, Krosky and Sinclair said, well, it's less about the actual errors. It's about the environment. How many distractions are you having? How many times, how crowded is your ED getting? How many times during the day are you at maximum capacity? The emergency care breaks down when it gets too full, when there's too many distractions, when the environment becomes ripe for error. Let's focus on trying to make our ED more like an OR, trying to keep it quiet, trying to keep it methodical, trying to keep it well staffed. So it's another way to look at it. And this administrator would actually come in and look at their dashboard and say, wow, we were at 2 p.m. we were too crowded, and again at 8 p.m. we were too crowded. Do we need to hire more staff? What do we need to do there? And this one I like even more. This is, we're starting to think about the ED as a system. Um, Crosby says, well, let's measure patient factors for errors, outside systems, human error, teamwork failure. So now they're starting to say, let's look at the separate components that make up an emergency department and talk about when they're working right and when they're not working wrong and try to create a system that gels together. And this is kind of closest to my idea of how we should approach error in the emergency department. And after our group work, we're going to talk about uh, the system that I, the way that I like to think about it. And we can talk about it as a group. Um, so one more systems break. Um, here we're talking about personnel. And so again, uh, at the top you see the nurses station in Black Lion Hospital, probably familiar to some of you. Um, you see a group of nurses debriefing in there. You see on the right side, uh, the medical residents are all doing their rounds. We have a visiting physician. I don't know if he's being helpful or not. Maybe he's helping care, maybe impeding it. I'm being funny. Um, and then down below, we see a line of patients. Um, do we know what's going on with these patients yet? Do we have their names? Do we have their vital signs? Um, is there a stoic farmer sitting there with an, a heart attack waiting his turn? Um, these are the things to think about. Is it best to have everybody rounding at the same time? Should the nurses be rounding at the same time as the doctors? Uh, is somebody working on that line there? And when you're designing emergency care, these are kind of the things that's going through your head. There's no right or wrong answer. It's what your patient population is. It's what your workload is. It's what resources you have. So, so we're going to skip the main event for now and come back to it. Um, and basically, in about five slides, we're going to uh, break up into groups and work through a problem together. Okay? And I'm going to go through my QI toolkit. So. These are kind of the most common tools that I use when I think about improving a process. You guys have probably seen some of them here today. You've probably seen a lot of others, different ones. And so um, just, it's just to show you kind of how I work, and then you can use them or, or not. You can use other tools as well. Um, so lean and six sigma, these are manufacturing terms that people have applied to healthcare. And lean is the idea that you can eliminate waste and um, make a process go faster, or you can make it uh, occur more efficiently. So we were talking about, if you're doing a suture, for example, you walk into the patient's room, and you clean up the wound, then you go and get your scalpel, then you go and get your um, saline, then you go and get your suture material, then you sit down, then you make it sterile. Well, what if you had all your suture materials in one cart, and you just rolled the cart next to the patient? Should the physician be doing that? Should the nurse be doing that? Um, is that a good use of their time? Could somebody else roll the card in and fix it up? You know, everyone should be practicing at the top of their license is something we say. So are you using people's time effectively? If you have personnel who can do that, who are trained enough to do that, why not have them do it? That's an example of how you could make a process cheaper or make it more efficient without really changing the process, but just doing it in a smarter way. So that's what lean is about. Six Sigma is actually about eliminating variation. So um, you're performing a procedure and you've got outcomes all across the board. So you're putting in chest tubes, some have pneumothorax, some are incompletely decompressed, some are 100% decompressed. How can you do this better? And this is the idea of continuous quality improvement. Every time you do a QI project, if you were to decrease the amount of out or the 
the variety of outcomes by one standard deviation, if you did this six times, eventually you'd have a pretty tight process where you can predict your outcomes, predict what's going to be, and then if you have an outlier that falls outside of that, you can say, why did that occur? And actually pin down the reason that occurred. So these are just kind of two ways of thinking about your overall process improvement. Um, this is an image from our ID badge here at UW. So UW is very good, I think, with um, building quality improvement into the resident and nursing mindset. And this is, how you, this is one way to approach a process. So when I give you your problem here, we're going to have a slide, talk about a hypothetical situation. I want you guys to find a process to improve. So we'll give you the situation. You say, OK, what could be better here? Um, organize a team. Who can help me with this process? You know, you want to make sure you have represent. You, you don't want a group of six doctors together solving a problem. That's probably that's a problem in itself. If you're not having buy-in from everyone, um, understand why that process or why that error occurred, and then you'll start your PDCA cycle. And you guys have seen the PDCA cycle, correct? Yeah. Um, and I think this is the fun part of quality improvement. This is the creative part where you pick a process apart. Um, you plan a new act, uh, an intervention to improve it, you do the intervention, and then you actually come up with metrics uh, so you can measure that you're actually improving. And metrics is so key in low resource settings because it's hard to measure things if you don't have regular records. So is it fair to say that some of your hospitals don't have regular records? Or do you think they're pretty, maybe? Yeah, so um, electronic records make it easier to measure things. With paper records, that, that involves somebody's time sorting through paper records. Some places you don't even have paper records. So how do you know that you're actually getting better? And that's a major challenge. Um, the fishbone diagram or the Ishikawa diagram you may have seen, this is that process of, of taking the process as a whole and dividing it into components and saying, OK, maybe the process itself is overwhelming, but how can I address individual components? Um, and then continuous quality improvement. So anytime we make something better, OK, we've improved hand washing by 20%. How are we going to keep it there? Are those gel containers going to stay full? Do we have enough funding to keep supplying those gel containers? Do we have somebody checking on our doctors and nurses and our techs, making sure that they're washing their hands now, not every day, but once a month or once every two months? Um, so the idea that if you've made your progress, don't lose it by kind of forgetting about it or leaving it on the back burner. So. Um, and finally, this isn't something we don't see a lot in healthcare. It's used more in manufacturing, but I like it a lot because it builds continuous quality improvement into the PDCA cycle. You define your problem, you measure what, you measure what outcome you want to achieve, um, you analyze it and come up with a project and actually do that intervention, and then you think of a way to sustain the progress that you've made. And so this is just the PDCA cycle and the idea of continuous quality improvement in one diagram. So I'll go ahead and read the case. Um, you are a QI consultant. You're an expert in QI work. You have been called in by the Minister of Health in Thailand to help this rural emergency department out. They have 12 beds. There's a surgical side and a medical side and a small procedure room. They have running water, sometimes electricity, a basic lab, and a portable x-ray machine. There are no advanced diagnostics, no CT scans, no MRI machines. Um, they do have an ultrasound. It happens to be broken at the time. Um, they do have medical records. They're all paper charts. Um, and then they have some specialties. So there's a general surgeon, an OB-GYN doctor, and an orthopedic doctor. No medical specialist, so no cardiology, no neurology. And two physicians staff the emergency department on 12-hour shifts. And when the physicians are having their day off, there's a charge nurse running the ED with a medical student, and the physicians are available on call. And then the patients are seen on a first-come, first-served basis, and the ED sees about 60 patients a day. So that's a pretty busy ED with some resources, but I would definitely say a low-resource environment, and they're having a problem. Now, before you go there, you do some reading about medical error in Thailand, and I, these, these are from actual studies, so please correct me uh, for our Thailand friends if I'm understating it. There's some societal norms in play. So it sounds like a systemic problem in Thailand is that patients sometimes have so much respect for healthcare professionals that they don't speak up. Do you guys feel like that's accurate? Maybe feel a little bit hesitant to mention things to a healthcare professional. They don't want to bother them. Uh, they don't want to interrupt their work. And then within healthcare itself, there's a deeply hierarchical structure to the extent that sometimes nurses wouldn't feel comfortable bringing up a problem with a doctor, or a tech might not feel comfortable bringing a problem up with a nurse. I think that's accurate. Um, and then I, I did read, I was talk, reading about medical error and reading about malpractice in Thailand, and I came across quite a few cases where 
uh, it seemed like malpractice occurred, but the medical record had disappeared. Um, and so there was actually, it seemed like there was, even at the administrative level, when an error did occur, that some hospitals had been losing records or trying to cover up error. So maybe just not the most open environment for talking about error, okay? That might not be the case everywhere, but this is, uh, this is what we're dealing with. Here's your problem. The Minister of Health called you in because in the last two weeks, four patients have died while waiting outside on the patio that the emergency department uses as a waiting room. The day that you show up, a 16-year-old boy who was out in the waiting room with appendicitis had his appendix burst. And when you walked in, you realized eight of the 12 beds were filled up with patients with minor orthopedic injuries, and that patient hadn't been seen. The physicians don't really know what the patient's chief complaint or vital signs is until they've been registered and come into the emergency department. So it's kind of a black box what's happening out there on the patio. And the nurses haven't really speaked up about it to anyone but you, but they've noticed that some patients are actually buying their way ahead in line. And so you see um, that the patients outside are trying to purchase spots higher in line. And so there's kind of a demand to get in the ED sooner and some sneaky things going on out there. So this is our first task here. Um, I want everybody to, I want there to be some leaders in the group. So every group, who's going to be your recorder in the group? Who's going to write things down? There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see a hand from each group. Who's going to record? Great. And we can do this together. I just want one person to be the leader. Mm -hmm. who's, going to, who's going to define the problem? So the planning leader is going to define the problem. Who's going to help us? Who's going to be the leader of saying what is the problem here? And there's a lot of different problems here, but you're going to choose one to fix. Thank you. Thank you. Who, this is the fun part. Who's going to come up with a quality improvement project? You're going to be working together, but who's going to be the boss in coming up with a quality improvement project? A chance to be creative, to lead a creative team. I want to see a hand. It's the fun part. OK, our group facilitators will. Uh, yeah. And then when I say evaluation team, I want somebody in charge of coming up with a real metric. So this is something that we are measuring. And you know, you only have paper charts. Bobby, yep. We've been using the term indicator or measure. So when he's saying metric, he's referring to the indicators like we were talking about before. Thank you very much. So what are your, what is your indicator going to be? How are you going to be able to tell that um, you're actually causing the process to improve? Um, and then we'll have one person be the spokesperson who will kind of share with the group what you talked about at the end. And this, I hope this is very low stress. So, Okay, so this is the first step. We have five minutes to name the problem. So we're using, you know, f we've found a team or we found a problem, we've organized a team. Let's name the problem. Was all the, within the next month, red card would be seen in 15 minutes. So um, I love this project. I think, I think it's admirable that you all came up with a similar solution. So um, the way I think of this is any ED, there's front end problems, there's back end problems, and then there's problems in the ED itself. So you could, a front end perspective to this would be, like you guys correctly identified, triage. We are not picking out the sickest patients well at, our, at the earliest possible moment, okay? Um, and another, another even more front-end way would be some sort of EMS system where ambulances bring in the sickest patients. So in my emergency department, if you come in by ambulance, you don't even wait in line. You get a special, you get a special ticket right into the ED. Um, a back-end problem is people aren't moving out of the ED fast enough. So you have little orthopedic injuries that are filling up all your beds. So maybe you could have those patients go back to the waiting room and wait. Maybe you could have a special flexible care area or a... Um, a place where an orthopedist tech or someone is watching them. Do they need to be sitting in your ED? That's a back-end problem. And then inside the ED, why are they waiting there that long? It, could there, you know, are the orthopedic patients, could they be splinted and sent out again? Or is it, is it just that they're waiting for their surgeon? So what's happening inside the ED? So there's lots of different ways to approach this. But a universal need in all emergency medicine, and I don't speak in absolutes a lot, but I really think I can in this time, is triage a sorting process. And I, I bet if we went to emergency rooms around the world, we would find that most don't have a sorting process. Do you think that's true? I've seen a lot of, uh, and you know, why is this? It's probably because 
There's no, nobody's overseeing the organization. So if your quality improvement had been hire an ED director, <laughs> that might have actually been a good solution as well. A lot of the ERs are just, let's put a doc down there and let them solve this on their own. One person, let's put a nurse down there and let them deal with the ER. Um, and that is, uh, you know, organization I think is key. And you know, when we look at this staff, you know, a lot of this is an organization process. But something as, we all know that the sickest patients need to be seen first, but why isn't it being done all around the world? And so when you go back to your home institutions, think about that. Think about your ED. Is there a triage system? Could that improve patient care? You know, maybe you can do something for your home communities based on this exercise. But I really applaud everyone. I think that was um, totally creative. I heard a lot of different solutions being talked about. So even though you came to an ultimate triage solution, I heard people talking about a fast track area where the orthopedic, or the orthopedic patients were taken out early and seen in a separate area. I heard people talking about um, using a camera and actually looking at who was in the waiting room or, or having vital signs appear there so you could use technology to make your physicians more aware. Um, I heard ideas being ruled out. So we were talk I heard people talking about, well, wouldn't ultrasound help us? If we had the ultrasound, would we be able to see the sickest patients first? Uh, maybe it's a bigger issue, actually. Um, and so there were all sorts of problems being discussed, and you guys kind of came up with the most salient, most important problem, and really approach it from a system standpoint. So I totally applaud you, and uh, I'll open it for questions.